Silicon Valley is today synonymous with high-tech startups and technology. It's a center for computer development and the home to many big-name high-tech companies. Over the last century, the Valley has earned that reputation being part of important developments in computer engineering, helping to birth the internet and attracting all those tech companies. But in the 1930s, that reputation was just beginning when the city of Sunnyvale sold land to the U.S. government to build an airfield, which is today known as Moffett Field. And Moffett Field and the work done there have done more than a little to help earn Silicon Valley its name. It is history that deserves to be remembered. In 1921, the United States Navy established the first airship hangar at the U.S. Naval Air Station in Lakehurst, New Jersey. The first American rigid airship, the USS Shenandoah, first flew in 1923. In 1926, the Navy authorized two more dirigibles, the USS Macon and the USS Akron, began searching for a site to house one of the airships on the West Coast. In California, widow and real estate agent Laura Thane Whipple heard that the Navy was looking for land for an airbase. According to the newspaper in the Mountain View Voice, the story goes that Whipple went looking for a location and looked out across 1,700 acres of farmland. She took a series of pictures, which she would later stitch into a panorama for the Navy. Buying the land was easier said than done. The land was parceled between eight different owners, though much of it was owned by the Hirsch Land Company, one of Whipple's clients. Whipple first presented the idea to the Mountain View Chamber of Commerce, and Whipple would eventually lead the charge to acquire the land, forming the Santa Clara Consolidated Air Base Committee. Since taking to the air, I have not been fancy free, she wrote to a friend. The air work has simply made it impossible for me to concentrate on anything else. Whipple got local support from chambers of commerce, local congressmen and politicians. Charles Lindbergh even lobbied on behalf of the site. Rear Admiral William Moffat, chief of the Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics and a key supporter of lighter-than-air aircraft, offered praise for the location as well. Four counties came together to pool $470,000, $8.5 million in 2023 dollars, to purchase 1,000 acres of land and offer to the Navy for a dollar. Congress approved the deal, and President Herbert Hoover signed the bill on February 20th, 1931. After the stock market crash of 1929, the area was excited for the jobs that building an airbase would bring. Akron visited the area in May of 1932, drawing as many as 300,000 people to the area. The initial proposed name was Naval Air Station Mountain View Sunnyvale, as the land sat between the two towns, but Navy officials dropped Mountain View out of concern that politicians would worry about air safety near a mountain. Construction on the massive Hangar 1 began on July 8, 1931. It wasn't until May of 1932 that the first of the massive steel arches was pulled into place. The hangar was designed by Dr. Carl Arnstein, VP and Director of Engineering at the Goodyear Zeppelin Corporation, along with Wilbur Watson Associates, architects and engineers. Rear Admiral A.L. Parsons, Chief of the Bureau of Yard and Docks, and Designer Lieutenant Commander E.L. Marshall, officer in charge of construction, were the Navy engineers in charge of the project. Goodyear had experience designing the enormous hangars necessary to house Zeppelins, as they had built the Goodyear Air Dock in Akron, Ohio, which housed both the Akron and the Macon airships during construction. The first building built was Hangar No. 1, which was meant to house the USS Macon, which was not yet completed. Hangar No. 1 is a massive building, it remains one of the largest freestanding structures in the world. 1,133 feet long, 308 feet wide, and 198 feet tall, it covers a full eight acres, or 3,200 square meters, large enough to fit nine football fields. It is so large that fog sometimes forms near the ceiling. Constructing such a large building required some clever thinking. Engineers constructed a huge mobile wooden frame, which sat upon eight 50-ton steel flat rail cars. The huge false work moved along tracks that ran the length of the hangar and was used to lift each of the huge arches that supported the structure into place. The enormous wooden contraption allowed 350 tons of steel to be moved into place at a time, allowing each arch to be placed in less than four days. At each end, enormous orange peel doors were installed, which run on their own engines along tracks. They were specifically designed to minimize wind while the dirigible would exit the hangar along two tracks that run the hangar's length. The hangar also contains various offices, storage spaces, inspection laboratories, and maintenance shops. The Macon, which would make NAS Sunnyvale its home, was christened on March 11th, but didn't make its first official flight until April 21st. After nearly two years of construction, Naval Air Station Sunnyvale was dedicated on April 12th, 1933, but the event was marred by the crash of the Akron eight days earlier. 
The Akron was assisting in the calibration of radio direction finder stations when she was caught in a storm. 73 people died in the crash, including Rear Admiral William Moffat. Only three crewmen survived. At 11.30 on April 12, Acting Commander of the Base M.J. Walker gave an order to Deputy Officer D.M. Mackey, enter in the log that the Sunnyvale station is placed in commission at 11.30 a.m., set the watches, and pipe down. By September 1, 1932, the name of the field was changed in honor of the late Rear Admiral. The base officially became Naval Air Station Moffett Field. Considerable construction continued into 1933. The Macon was commissioned on June 23, 1933, and arrived at Moffett Field on October 15th. For the next two years, the hangar was home base for the Macon, as well as several other lighter-than-air aircraft that could be sheltered within. All of that ended when the Macon was caught in a storm near Point Sur, California, on February 12, 1935, and destroyed. Loss of the Macon ended the era of rigid airships. On February 26, the rigid airship program was canceled. Moffat had lost its primary reason for existence. Naval aircraft squadrons began using the base. However, the base was expensive to maintain and run. Simultaneously in San Diego, the Army and Navy were sharing a base near San Diego on North Island. Naval Air Station San Diego and the Army's Rockwell Field were both centers for air training in the days before a dedicated air force. Growing reliance on aircraft carriers meant that the Navy wanted more land bases to train their pilots, but the Army didn't want to give up Rockwell. The two services had been battling over the issue of North Island for decades, each wanting the other to shove off. Neither side was willing to budge, but finally, in 1935, President Roosevelt, a former Assistant Secretary of the Navy, intervened. Roosevelt pushed through a compromise, which included the shuffling of a number of bases, but gave North Island to the Navy and NAS Sunnyvale to the Army. The Army was no happier with Hangar No. 1's high maintenance costs, but Roosevelt refused to allow the Army to close the base. During this period, the Army based numerous units at the base, including the 82nd Army Observation Squadron and the 9th Air Base Material Squadron. In 1939, it became home to the 20th Pursuit Group. Many pilots were trained at Moffett, including actor Jimmy Stewart. That same year, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, NASA's predecessor, established a laboratory at the base, which in 1944 was designated the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory in honor of NACA founder member Joas Sweetman Ames. The attack on Pearl Harbor and America's entry into World War II saw all branches of the military swell, and the Army based the new Western Flying Training Command at Moffett. Now on a war footing, however, the Navy wanted Moffett back to use as a lighter-than-air base to launch balloons that could scout the West Coast for submarines. The Army again pushed back and again was ordered to make way for the Navy. The base was recommissioned Naval Air Station Sunnyvale on April 16, 1942, and again rechristened Naval Air Station Moffett Field four days later. The need for blimp operations led to the construction of two more large hangars at Moffett, called Hangars 2 and 3. They were somewhat smaller than Hangar 1 and made of wood instead of steel. The hangars were completed in 1942 as part of a program that built 17 anti-submarine blimp hangars around the country. On January 1, 1942, Blimp Squadron, or ZP-32, was established at Sunnyvale. There was just one problem. They didn't have any blimps. Two former Army airships, TC-13 and TC-14, had been transferred to the Navy when Army airship operations were terminated, and the two blimps were hastily loaded aboard trains at Lakers, New Jersey, to be transferred to Sunnyvale. They arrived on January 27th, and by February 1st, TC-14 made its first flight. TC-14 was sent to Santa Barbara, California, after a Japanese submarine shelled an oil field there on February 23rd. More airships were delivered, including L-type blimps that had previously been part of the Goodyear commercial fleet. Several more L-types were constructed by engineers at Moffett Field. While mostly used for training, L-8 delivered B-25 modification parts to the USS Hornet in April 1942, parts vital to the Doolittle Raiders on board. L-8 was later discovered floating derelict and partially deflated. Its crew disappeared and is often called the Ghost Blimp. The base also operated Goodyear-built K-type blimps, and Goodyear established a manufacturing facility that eventually built 39 blimps for the Navy at Moffett. ZP-32 performed a wide variety of jobs during the war, logging over 67,000 hours of flight time. In addition to patrolling and other duties, they often pointed out fish chills for local fishermen. During the war, blimp pilots were trained first at Moffett before traveling to the base at Lakehurst, and the anti-submarine training unit Moffett was formed, using OS-2U Kingfishers. Numerous Navy aircraft also did scientific work with Ames, including an FR-1 Fireball, the first Navy plane 
to use a jet engine. By the end of the war, blimps had largely become obsolete, and training programs ceased in 1944. Blimp operations ended for good in 1947. In mid-1945, the 1st Naval Air Transport Service Squadron was assigned to Moffett. The squadron played a large role in the Berlin Airlift in the 1950s. Moffett was a major naval and military air transport service base after 1945, and in 1948 also became a helicopter overhaul and repair base. The Korean War again altered Navy operations, and during the war, Moffett served as a jet fighter base. During the 1950s, 20 squadrons did training at Moffett as headquarters for Commander Naval Air Transport Wing Pacific, Air Transport Squadrons 7 and 8, three carrier air groups, and several aircraft squadrons. In 1953, Moffett was designated the first Navy Master Jet Base, a permanent home port for carrier-based jet squadrons. By the end of the 1950s, however, most Navy planes were jet-powered and needed longer runways. Low-altitude landing approaches for training pilots for carrier landing became more difficult as the Bay Area became more developed, and by 1961, all Navy fighters were transferred elsewhere. NASA was officially created in 1958, and the Ames Aeronautical Laboratory was transferred to the new agency and renamed the Ames Research Center. With the fighters gone, Moffett became the anti-submarine center on the West Coast, flying the brand-new P-3 Orion maritime surveillance aircraft. The Navy's anti-submarine warfare organization and command was based at Moffett, supporting bases all over the Pacific. Seven anti-submarine squadrons were based at Moffett throughout the 1960s, as well as a reserve squadron. During the Cold War, planes flew out of Moffett daily on reconnaissance missions, patrolling 241 million square kilometers in the Pacific by 1973. The P-3s were deployed based on hydrophones in the sound surveillance system deployed across the Pacific and then dropped further hydrophones to identify Soviet submarines as they sailed in the Pacific. Flying at 20,000 feet, the P-3s could track a Soviet sub to within a few yards. Moffett trained all ground crew for the Orion on the West Coast. In 1984, the 129th Rescue Wing of the California Air National Guard was transferred to Moffett. The end of the Cold War and the disintegration of the Soviet Union significantly decreased the need for anti-submarine patrols. By 1991, base realignment and closure actions identified Moffett for closure. Squadrons and activities were transferred or deactivated. On July 1, 1994, the airbase was handed over to NASA Ames and became Moffett Federal Airfield. The base is still used for air traffic by the California Air National Guard, Lockheed Martin Space Systems, Air Force One, and the Google Founders for their private planes. In 2003, plans to turn Hangar 1 into a space and science center were put on hold when it was discovered the hangar is leaking toxic chemicals into the soil. The chemicals came largely from exterior panels, which were removed beginning in 2011. In 2014, a Google subsidy signed a 60-year lease for $1.2 billion for the use of the airbase, although its exact future use remains undetermined. Moffett Airfield today is unique. It is the only private airfield on federal property and is used extensively by private companies. The history of Moffett Field stretches from the great dirigibles of the 1930s to the cutting-edge technology of the future. As the world changed, so did the role of the air base, from a center for lighter-than-air technology to a fighter base to a center for U.S. Navy patrols in the Pacific. And all the while, the airfield and the research center that was attached to it helped to attract technology companies to the Bay Area, helping to create the world-famous center for computer and technological innovation that is known as Silicon Valley. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop, book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.